Uh, whilst people are taking, taking their seat, I would just make one comment after those, that last very sobering uh, discussion. Um, there is a very large NGO uh, advocacy against insecticides, which is making it very difficult to get research funded into insecticides. MSF can take them on, government scientists cannot. And I really would encourage you to think very seriously about that. This is, with antimicrobial resistance, one of the big threats to a lot of the work that all of you do. Uh, now we're all here, some fantastic uh, presentations, plenty of things we could discuss. Who'd like to go first? As always, please introduce yourselves first. Gentlemen at the back, uh, uh, in the middle there. And then we'll have an online question second. Hello, Jacob Levi, I'm a medical student and Friends of MSF member. Um, I was wondering if there's been any research into the relationship between the rise of malaria and climate change in any of these settings. I know it's a huge issue um, in the IPCC report and WHO. Uh, thanks. Does anyone want to answer these? No? Well, there is a lot of ongoing research on um, climate change and the influence on malaria and modelling. There are fantastic modelling programmes out there. The trouble is with Congo that it's a, it's a vast, vast country with many microclimates, um, and it's not the most accessible part for research. So for parts of Congo, we have very good data on temperature and climate, um, but for most of the parts, we don't. So, so yes, there's a lot of research going on, but not in Congo. I think we have an online question next. Yes. So I have a question from Dr. Malanga in Zimbabwe who's um, asking, I wonder how effective the medical adherence club model would be in distributing drugs versus the MDA approach? Why don't we start off? I think probably we're going to get two answers to that one. Why don't you, why don't you start off? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it's the question how much the adherence plays the role in, the, in this mass drug distribution. So I don't know if this is the question. Um, that's right, don't worry, I think. Yeah. Um, there's another question as well, please, from MSF UK. So it's for the panel. And the question is, um, interventions like M SMC should ideally be repeated and sustained. How does this fit into the mo MSF model of working? Would we expect a rebound if not sustained, for example, if the ministries of health cannot take it over? Is this then a responsible intervention? Hello. Uh, okay, so SMC normally it's uh, the activity uh, that prevents uh, the malaria infection for a certain period of time. So normally it's it's it's, it's a one month. And then of course also this year there was a big problem of shut uh, of uh, drug shortage. Uh, and it was privileged actually to continue to do SMC in the countries that already started in previous years. So for the moment, MSF didn't stop uh, any SMC in countries that started, but with a lot of fundings available, we think it will be continued, but with other pa partners in the future. Gentlemen here in the check shirt. Hello, uh, Frederick Seelig from Malaria World Journal. So very interesting talk, especially in the end about malaria in, in, in the Congo, and especially the description of this very high resistance rate of, uh, against insecticides and the poor effectivity of, of the bed nets. So my question would be, um, do you think that more active factor controls, such as active insect trapping or larvicidal activity, if that would be feasible to supplement uh, the provision of bed nets? Yes, I think it's uh, very useful to do more vector studies in this kind of locations, because now we only know what happened on one time point, but it's very interesting to know what will happen in time, because we already see that uh, resistance is developing, so we really have to take care um, what kind of ins insecticides we use in, uh, in the houses for sprays, but also on the bed nets. So it's really useful to do more vector studies. Lady down here. And if you want to ask a question, if you put your hand up now, I then know how many questions I want to rattle through by the end. Yeah. Uh, hi, Emily from St Mary's Hospital. It's also a question for Marit. Thank you for a great talk. The uh, uh, patients where uh, you detected recrudescence by sending the blood spots to Holland for PCR, were you able to genotype those strains and did you find wild type or resistant strains? So far, what we've done where we are at at the moment um, is that we did the PCR, and now we're going to sequence them. So we're at the stage of sequencing them. Yeah. Thank you. Gentlemen, just before, in front of the pillar there. Hi, I'm Joost van der Meer. I'm from the board of MSF Holland. Um, my question is also for Marit, and, and thank you for an excellent presentation about a very fascinating trend that we see. Okay, can you be a bit 
more specific about what your theory is about what is you mentioned some factors right environmental etc but do you have do you have a more specific theory of what might be the case <laughs> to be really disappointing no i think we're all a bit lost uh, i think there's several factors in play one is that at a certain point when you get a rise in cases such a large population of the is, is infected that you get a really rapid increase which is hardly stoppable. So if you go down, all, also you get a very... So if 1% of the population is infected, the chance that a mosquito actually bites that one person is really quite low. So the whole transmission chain goes down. I think we've reached a point in Congo where it's just gone completely wild. Uh, these were our first four guesses. And apart from the vector study, it hasn't yielded a lot. So we, you know, we were thinking, oh, there might be a superbug out there, but we didn't find superbugs. So, yeah, we have to continue the research. Gentleman down here at the front. Um, one of the uh, Charles from MSF UK. Okay? Um, one of the reasons I think that drives malaria is both the behaviour of the mosquito and also human behaviour. I wonder if one of the studies looked into. Uh, the human behavior, um, especially w how, how long do people stay outside before they go to bed. But also when you mentioned about the river, something echoed to me. I've ever worked near a lake, and actually people use mosquito nets for other activities rather than <laughs> using them. Shall I? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yes, the human behavior is certainly the next step, what I indicated. We need to see how long people stay outside. Um, uh, you know, there are other factors that have, like the, the, just that there is more electricity actually keeps people outside for longer and things like that. So we need to look into that for sure. Um, the second question, help me now. The, uh, fishing nets, fishing yes, 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 fishing nets, yes. Um, <laughs> What can I say? Yes and no. I think with the study that Ruby did um, for, the, for the, the knowledge and attitude, there are lots of people, once they associate the mosquito with malaria, um, that are willing to sleep under a bed net. Um, I think we need to have more innovative approaches to the bed nets, for example. Like, you know, the really clever ones now where there is a small light inside the mosquito net, which makes you want to sit and read inside a mosquito net. So there are clever ways to, to evolve those, or you can print now. You can have really, like, Arsenal, I don't know what, uh, <laughs> on your bed net. So that's really good things. But, um, but yes and no. So yes, you see them everywhere. But I also think when you ask people, and this is more random anecdotal evidence, if you ask them, like, and they also protect their crops with it, but they're old ones because we keep redistributing them. So I think the good part from the, from the, from the, um, vec, from the cap, CAP survey is that you see that if people have, are knowledgeable, that they're really quite happy to sleep under them. And actually, one of the really nice studies, part of the study was that we could see that if people had, had been explained by MSF, um, I have to get my notes now, but they were like five times more likely to hang them correctly and not to wash them and not to hang them in the sun too often. And so good explanation really helps with good bed net distribution. I th I'm, the ones that you see are not all the ones they should sleep in, I'm quite sure. You'd like to come in and I'm gonna comment also on that one. Uh, maybe one thing, because there was a question on adherence, I was not sure what it was, but I would like to uh, jump on to Marit said on, on qualitative things. And actually, when we evaluated the adherence through the quantitative survey, we got the figure like over 99%, which really doesn't seem very realistic. But when we did a qualitative evaluation and observation at home, we realized that there, there, there is a lot of problems of taking the tablets at home. So it's also, we need to be very careful which method we use to evaluate uh, different subjects. My comment would be, if it is true that um, there is a reduction in, uh, th there's an increase in malaria as a result of a reduction in mosquito susceptibility, that is a very important finding. However, following on from Charles's, I do wonder whether uh, there could be some issue about health-seeking behaviour, uh, which could have also given a rise this apparent <coughs> introduction. Gentlemen at the back, lady at the front, both ask, and then that's the final two questions, and I'll ask any member of the panel to ask those, answer those two. Uh, thank you, Tom Church, Imperial College. Just to go beyond that, what you just suggested is, do you have any idea if the population is stable? Um, because could you just not be seeing an increase in incidence because of an increased number of people? Um, not discounting the fact that you clearly have issues with insecticide resistance. 
and the lady, lady here at the front. Uh, Bhagavi Rao, MSF UK. Um, John, you made the point very well that malaria control was a critical part of uh, the Ebola response. I wondered if you had any thoughts on what the role of malaria control is as we start to think about the post-Ebola response. So what should MSF be doing in Sierra Leone and Liberia going forward? John, do you want to start? Sure, that's a very good question. And I think, um, you know, MSF did those mass uh, distributions as an emergency measure. And uh, it, um, e Ebola care, or sorry, malaria healthcare is an essential component, as is a lot of things like uh, maternal health care and things that uh, I think the assumption was that uh, the healthcare systems would get up and running faster than they did. And so just um, my conversations with colleagues in the field was, was that, uh, you know, that was a lesson learned is to get, um, is to address other healthcare needs, not just, not just malaria, but, but certainly um, prenatal care and safe deliveries and, um, and addressing other healthcare needs because uh, that really suffered during the Ebola outbreak, and that was really inexcusable. Yes, to come back to your question. Um, so we have no indications that there is a, a comparable rise in population. There has certainly been some shifts in population, especially in North Kivu, but not so much in South Kivu and Katanga. The other, there were far more ways that we could see that there was an increase. One of them is, for example, that every woman who comes to antenatal care, regardless of, of, of her symptoms, will be tested for malaria every time she comes. And there we could see a steady increase in positivity rates over the past years, showing that the random population uh, uh, has more, there is more malaria, or at least more parasite carriage in the random population. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers for some excellent talks and very interesting discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We've got half an hour for the break. Um, I just wanted to remind the speakers uh, and the chair for the next session to come down to the front. And uh, I just wanted to pick up, because there was a couple of people who picked up on a couple of the questions, and it might be something for discussion. How do we measure the impact of our preventative measures uh, as MSF or other organisations? A very challenging question for research. Thank you very much.